Okay, so hi everyone. Welcome to Defend 3. We are on week nine, so we're almost halfway. Um, today we have a guest speaker, Dr. Lindsay Aloya, on the influence of influencers in media and marketing on behavior. But before I turn it over to Lindsay, I will um, just go over a few reminders. So post, don't forget to post your challenges on Facebook or via email. Um, I know it's like halfway through and interest tends to be dropping off, but keep posting your challenges. We'd love to see them. We'd love to see how you're progressing. Here's the link to our Facebook page and our email address. Attend the personalized sessions. We've been getting a lot more uh, attendees, but Mondays we talk about behavior change, Tuesday about nutrition, and Thursday about physical activity. And then don't forget, you can always anonymously submit topics you want to learn more about through our website. You'll see this on the top right part of the website. Um, we've had some really great discussions and we really look forward to hearing all of you. And again, if we really, if you're struggling to meet your challenges or your SMART goals, um, calling in on these sessions can be really helpful. So the challenge for the upcoming week, I think Emma will post it in the Facebook page, is to try one new fruit. So hopefully everyone managed to try one new vegetable last week. Um, our nutrition, health, or and cooking demo will be quick and easy recipes using fruit. Our physical activity demo will be how to modify different online workouts to suit you and your um, physical activity needs. And then um, the link to our YouTube channel. And finally, next week will be our official halfway point. So we'll post the midway questionnaire. Everyone's welcome to take it, but we encourage everyone who's in the research part of the study to please take this questionnaire. We'll send you the link um, as soon as it's available. Um, our, our topic next week will be improving our food and physical activity environments. And we'll have a grocery store challenge for the week. So I'll go ahead and stop sharing and Lindsay, if you want to share your screen, I'll do your do the introduction. So Dr. Lindsay Aloya, she earned her PhD in communication from the Pennsylvania State University in 2013. After working as a postdoc research fellow for two years, she joined the Department of Communication at the U of A in 2015 and is currently an associate professor. I think, is that news since I last saw you probably? Congratulations. It is. Thank you. Thank you. In the Department of Communication. And she serves as the director for the Center for Communication Research. And for any U of A faculty on the call, Lindsay's an awesome collaborator and they have lots of cool capabilities in the communications department. Her research focuses on elucidating the causes and consequences of verbal aggression in interpersonal associations. And she specifically studies how qualities of interpersonal interactions, as well as individuals, shape the use of reactions to verbally aggressive experiences. Her work more generally considers the consequences, consequential nature of communication to illuminate the personal, relational, and health implications of messages. So we're really happy to have you today, and thank you for volunteering your time to us. Oh, of course. Thank you so much, Jamie, for the kind introduction. And as Jamie mentioned, um, I'm Lindsay, and I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here today to talk to you about the influence of influencers on social media. Um, but I had, as expected during the pandemic, uh, a bit of a glitch. My internet at my house went out. So I am uh, going to roll with out slides today, um, but I'm happy to share my slides with you um, if you'd like to see them. Uh, I'm actually doing this from my cell phone, so we'll see. Hopefully everything runs smoothly, but if not, uh, help me roll with it. Uh, so like Jamie said, I'm here today to talk to you about the influence of influencers on social media and their power to both market, but also create behavioral change. In ancient Greece, citizens met in the Agora, which was a public space in the center of the city, a place to gather, to discuss economics, politics, uh, to engage in even social events. The Agora also served as a space to centralize business, and so it brought people to one location, a location where they could browse, they could shop, they could share reviews about products with members of their community. So forums, as we understand them today, have actually long existed. 
Today, however, a lot of those forums exist in a digital space. And of course, the pandemic has accelerated the relevance of social media, not only now as a guilty pleasure, but also as a somewhat contemporaneous necessity. So the days of thinking about social media as an indulgence or a bad habit, maybe even as a generational flaw, are essentially gone. Instead, it's become one of the most integral aspects of modern society, particularly, again, during a pandemic, where a lot of our real world or face-to-face -face forums have disappeared. When the opportunity to meet, as the ancient Greeks once did in the Agora, uh, is no longer available to us. According to a recent study, about 3.484 billion people uh, are active users of social media. So that's about 45% of the world's population. And where are people going? Well, they're spending time on sites like YouTube or Reddit. Twitch, Tumblr, and today I'd like to talk about three of the most popular social media platforms, namely Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. So despite ongoing controversies and ever-emerging competition, Facebook is still the most used and engaged social media platform with 2.7 billion monthly active users. Facebook allows users to create profile pages revealing information about themselves. Facebook users can post text, can post videos, or other multimedia, which is then shared with users either publicly or with users that the individual has agreed to share with by friending. There are also instant messaging capabilities through Facebook platform. The largest age group on Facebook is actually 25 to 34 year olds, which may be surprising. Um, it abandons the idea that the younger crowd has left Facebook, um, which has been a running uh, trend. However, there is an influx of boomers to Facebook, uh, although we still see the largest age group again as 25 to 34 year olds. 44% of users are female, with 56% of users identifying as male. And due to Facebook's sheer size and engagement rate of approximately 38 minutes a day, Facebook has remained a must for both advertisers and influencers as a key space for marketing. Instagram's steady growth is also well-documented, cementing it as the second largest network after Facebook, with approximately 1 billion monthly active users. It allows users to post square images and videos with text to a personal page. Similar to Facebook, there are also instant messaging capabilities through Instagram, and there are also stories that are accessible to other people for up to 24 hours. Akin to Facebook, the largest group of individuals participating in Instagram are 25 to 34-year-olds. This is actually quite surprising, given that Instagram used to be incredibly popular among younger users. Unfortunately for Instagram, though, the platform is facing fierce competition from other social media sites like TikTok and applications like Snapchat. 57% of Instagram users identify as female and 43% of users identify as male. Recent Instagram statistics highlight the value of influencers in shaping social media public opinion over the value of traditional advertisers. In addition, because both Facebook and Instagram share the same ad platform, there's increased opportunities for cross-promotion across both of the sites. And that gives the opportunity for individuals to market both their brands, their products, and of course, themselves. Twitter's usage and user base and growth have actually been fairly consistent year to year. There are approximately 187 million monthly active users on Twitter. 
And the platform's pretty straightforward. It allows for posts, including 280 characters or less. This though, design signals to users that it's a place to gather kind of quick sound bites of information or to post limited amounts of content. Twitter users are actually quite older than Facebook and Instagram users on average, and the largest age group on Twitter are 30 to 49-year-olds. Again, interestingly, Twitter is also male-dominated. 68% of users of Twitter are male, and 32% of users identify as female. People also spend a lot less time on Twitter than they do other social media sites, with an average session lasting about three and a half minutes. Similar to Instagram, though, there is immense value placed on influencers. In fact, 80% of tweets come from 10% of the platform's most active accounts, suggesting that not only are their influencers, but they are quite powerful in that space. And it has made corporate advertising on Twitter actually much more difficult due to both the influence of influencers and the constraints of the platform. Taken together, these social media sites, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, all demonstrate the reach of social media marketing, in particular, the influence of influencers. So what exactly is an influencer? Well, back in Greece, in ancient Greece, when we gathered in person in these agoras or city centers, we would describe these people as opinion leaders. They were people who interpreted messaging or content for other individuals. They were people who diffused ideas and dispersed ways of thinking for others. And sometimes they were experts in particular fields. So for a contemporaneous example, within the field of cosmetology, my hairstylist is an opinion leader. When I sit in her chair, she advises me how I should cut my hair, what products I should use, what products I should avoid using, etc. Interestingly, though, my hairstylist also happens to be an influencer. In addition to the individuals that she sees face to face, like myself, she's also acquired a notable base of followers online, which makes her reach then global. She's not a celebrity in the traditional sense. She's a typical individual who posts in her area of expertise. She posts about her interests. She is sponsored by brands that produce beauty products, but she also advertises products that she just uses and enjoys. She certainly promotes certain opinions um, and certain behaviors. And as suggested by the title, influencer, she has social influence. Consumers are, in fact, more often using internet forums and social media to make both purchasing decisions and lifestyle choices, more so than traditional forms of advertising or print media. Four in five U.S. online consumers, so individuals who report having purchased products online, have made a purchase by clicking a link on social media or an image that an influencer has shared. Consider the feedback or comments sections, the reviews of a product online. How many of you have at some point relied on that information when you considered making a purchase? In fact, the term influencer in and of itself has increased 325% in Google searches during the past year. And this trend is likely to continue, especially considering that two-thirds of marketing departments are looking to increase their budgets for influencing influencer marketing over the upcoming year. In fact, the influencer marketing industry is expected to hit $10 billion by 2022. And generally, this money is well spent. For every dollar spent on influencer marketing, the market sees an average of $7.65 in earned value returned. 
Many social media influencers are considered by their followers to, in fact, be credible sources of information. 66% of people trust a product recommendation as long as the influencer discloses his, her, or their relationship with the brand. This number increases the more focused the intended influence. So consider my hairstylist, for example. Her Instagram account is primarily focused on one subject, hair and beauty. Accordingly, she's perceived as being an authority when addressing things related to those topics, more so than a sports blogger would be or a nutritionist, for example. She's built a reputation for having knowledge in that area and for having built her expertise. She makes regular posts within that area of expertise. She's also energetic, she's enthusiastic, and she's not alone. Nearly three out of four US marketers agree that influencers are concerned about whether their posts actually drive sales for the brands that they're advertising. In other words, not only are they excited, but they are motivated. In addition to this focused, excited expertise, attractiveness matters in this space. So this is a strategy that marketers have used for ages. Um, hire a handsome Hollywood actor or a gorgeous supermodel to represent your brand. Humans are, of course, susceptible to the attractiveness bias, where we subconsciously attribute attractive people with other positive qualities. This also transfers to positive associations between the person and an advertised brand or lifestyle. It essentially primes people for a positive review of whatever it is an influencer is discussing related to a positive review of that influencer, him, her, or themselves. It's also, though, a numbers game, right? More followers, more shares, more likes equals more social proof that influencers' opinions, perspectives, judgments, that they, that they matter. Moreover, that those opinions, judgments, and perspectives are right. Interestingly, men are more highly influenced by the numbers game than women. In fact, men more generally are likely to spend money on recommended products than women and are more likely to buy products at a higher price point than when endorsed by an influencer than women. Finally, the more personable the influencer, the more connection that they create, uh, the more that the influencer actually engages with his, her, or their followers, the more likely a follower is to purchase an advertised product or conduct an endorsed behavior. So perceived connection is actually of primary importance in this space. Followers are often exposed to influencers' everyday lives. Loyal fans know the ins and outs of influencers' preferences, their experiences, their homes, oftentimes their families. Influencers provide these snapshots for followers into their everyday lives. In addition, oftentimes people follow influencers who are of similar ages, similar races, and have similar interests to their followers. And despite immense popularity, influencers are perceived as mostly normal people, down to earth, relatable, and followers feel as though they really know the influencers. But do they? <laughs> um, the appearance of ease, the simplicity of life, all of the good and none of the bad, it obstructs the reality of what life actually entails. Displaying only the highlight reel as an influencer has actually encouraged unintended effects of followers. So yes, they buy products, they change their behaviors, they construct new opinions based on those of the influencer. But individuals who describe themselves as devoted followers of influencers are also more likely to develop psychological difficulties, things like anxiety, depression, and disassociation. 
Followers can also develop extreme behaviors um, and sometimes even criminal actions such as stalking. In addition, devoted followers have trouble often with self-acceptance, uh, increased levels of materialism, and increased levels of desire for social approval. And this becomes especially true in younger demographics who are more easily influenced by the desire for social connection. So in a time where agora are less common, where meeting face-to-face -face is discouraged, especially given the COVID-19 pandemic, we rely on social media. We rely on these forums to browse, shop, and share reviews about products with members of our communities. We are influenced online by people who were previously described as opinion leaders and are now called influencers. And that influence, it changes our behavior, changes our judgments, it influences our purchases. But that influence also has some unintended effects that are worth considering. So next time you open up Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, be aware, notice the influence of those who are most influential. With that, um, I will open it up for any questions that you might have, and hopefully I have some answers. Thanks, Lindsay. That was great. Um, I think, you know, like I know it's a big challenge. How, how do you have any suggestions on how like followers can tell if their influencer is maybe full of crap? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because especially when we're thinking about the nutrition and wellness space, there's a lot of information out there. Like, how do you know if it's true? Maybe. So I think one of the benefits of operating in this online space is you can look up who these people actually are, what kind of training they have, where they've received their education, et cetera. So one of the benefits of actually operating outside of a face-to-face -face forum and being on social media is that you do have the opportunity to kind of do some digging and research before just readily accepting um, the opinions or advice of influencers. But I will say that we all fall victim to the things that I mentioned, right? The attractiveness bias, something looks really good, something sounds really good, uh, something sounds really easy, especially in the areas of diet and nutrition or in exercise, right? And those feel like quick fixes and it's hard to not fall victim to that. Um, the truth is, is we, we fall victim to it in other spaces too, right? We hear advice from other people who are not necessarily qualified to discuss that advice. Um, and it is, it's hard to sort through uh, the good and the bad, but it's worth trying to do that sort. Um, and unfortunately, I think it, it kind of lands on the shoulders of the recipient of the information to examine the credibility of the source that's disclosing it. I mean, I always tell people if it sounds too good or easy to be true, like it probably is. <laughs> okay, we have a couple chat questions. So how can you go about finding your target audience on social media, e media even if you don't know who your target audience is yet? So um, typically your target audience tends to be people who are similar to you. Um, and that's what we find on social media. Uh, when people are, selecting who to follow. Um, typically, it's people who are very similar to themselves, who have the same interests, who are generally in the same age bracket, who have similar educational experiences, um, etc. And so oftentimes, uh, who follows who depends upon similarities, right? It's that kind of bird of a feather flock together argument. Um, actually finding followers, I'm not really sure to be perfectly honest. I don't spend much time on social media um, and I'm not sure how 
recruiting followers actually works in the space of influencers. Um, oftentimes it's cross promotion. So people become sponsored by particular products. Um, and that cross promotion can help then gain that individual some more influence. Um, but in, in spaces where you are not necessarily endorsed by a brand or a product, I think um, actually acquiring those followers becomes a bit more challenging. Great. And another question we had is, um, can you see the chat, by the way? Because I can read that. Uh, I, so I you just got a big thank you for the advice. And then oh. another question is, what are so what social media platforms are younger users frequent frequenting? So like I think also it's um, relevant to sort of like academia as well. You know when we're trying to reach our younger like undergraduate students. Yes. So fascinatingly, um, I thought that Instagram would have had a huge following of the younger demographic, but as it turns out, that is constantly shifting, right? Because there are so many competitors within the space of social media, the younger demographic actually jumps ship quite frequently. Um, so your biggest social media site is still Facebook. And like I said, second is Instagram. Uh, so there are younger users on those two sites. Um, uh, although the biggest demographic is a bit older than that. Snapchat and, um, oh wait, I have it written down because I had not. Oh, and TikTok um, tend to be demographics of younger users. And that's right now. So, so part of the problem is, is that because they don't stay highly committed to one social media site, um, that is constantly changing. Right now, that's where they are, but we suspect that very soon they'll be on a new site. Um, there was a, this uh, site of Twitch. I don't, I'm not familiar with it. Um, is it primarily gaming site. Uh, and there are a lot of younger users on that moving to that space. But again, as predicted, they'll likely migrate to a new space quite soon. I mean, I actually like have a TikTok account, but I have no idea how to like post on TikTok. But I do say I have like lost hours of my life scrolling through like one minute tidbits. And it is amazing the ways that social media posts have changed so significantly. So it used to be like, you just said what you were doing that day. Um, it functioned really similar to an away message on uh, AOL Instant Messenger. And then that very quickly changed. Then social media became a space to share pictures. Um, and then that is changing now too. Pictures are less effective than these multimedia. And so people are creating videos um, that are more readily available than they ever have been before. So it's amazing how even not only where people are posting, but what people are choosing to post has changed so significantly. But TikTok is full of like social consciousness, which I, I like. But um, okay, we have time for one or two more questions. And we did get a request. If you could send a PDF of your slides when your internet is back and running so we can post them on okay. our site and we can watch the video at the same time. Any other questions for Lindsay before our session ends? This was really great and informative. And I think it really helps because I think that's one thing we also struggle with this research project is how do you keep people engaged and beyond like this halfway point because people do mm -hmm. tend to lose interest in like lifestyle and wellness after a couple months. So it's really interesting um, to hear. It's so. fascinating to think about the same things that worked in traditional print media, right? Having somebody attractive tell you something. Um, like. It's amazing that that is still primarily what helps, but now adding on that layer of personal connection of feeling really tied to that individual and the fact that people have found ways to craft those messages to make millions of people feel really connected and tied to them is, is really remarkable. I mean, it's, it's a beautiful strategy. It's, it's hard to do, but when you do it effectively, it, it really is fantastic so yeah. well, anyway, well thank you yeah of and course have a great me. weekend and if you have any additional questions you can send them to myself and we'll forward them on okay sounds great everyone. i'd love to hear from you thank okay. you
Have a nice day.